Go with me, please, to 1 Peter. We've been, talking about, we've been talking about hope. We've been talking about the kind of hope that honestly only Jesus can give. We're not talking about Pollyanna hope. We're not talking about a wishful thinking kind of hope. We're talking about a hope that comes only from Jesus. There's this statement from Peter when he says, always be ready, always be ready to give a reason to everyone who asks, to anyone who asks for the hope that you have. And we were talking last week about how, how hope, hope is a, it's a supernatural deal. It's not something that, that you get hope because you learn something new. It's not that you get hope because you took a class in how to have hope. It's not something that you get because, because something changed. It's not about a minute. It's not about a circumstance. Hope is a supernatural gift from God that having been given can be developed as you pursue your hope in Jesus. And so today we're talking about, today we're talking about this, this, this idea of a hope that is higher than I. A hope, a hope that reaches higher than I can reach. A hope that I stand on in order to reach the upper shelf that I can't reach apart from hope. A hope that is higher than I. And I want us to just spend some time there because if your hope burns through, if your hope burns through, you're not going to have anybody asking about the hope you profess. Nobody's going to wonder where your hope comes from if your hope has been burned through. So here's some questions that we're going to grapple with and then come back to at the end of the time. If you want to snap a picture of the questions, if you want to write them down so that you can hold on to them and think about them later. But here's the one. What is your hope built on? I posed that question in that email that we sent out earlier in the week and in that, in that Facebook post. What is your hope built on? And one precious lady, Ethan, it was your aunt, she wrote back and she says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And I thought, well, praise God. Praise God. That is, a, that is a lyric from a song that we've been holding on to for generations. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ the solid rock I stand. Because all other ground is shifting sand. What is your hope built on? Because if your hope is built on your best guess, it won't last. If your hope is built on your ability to grasp and comprehend the situation, it will not last. If your hope is built on your ability to hold on and hold firm, you know this, Mason, it won't last. Your hope must be built. The only ground for hope is the hope that comes in Jesus. And that's what I want us to talk about today, a hope that is higher than I, because how about you? Has your hope ever burned through? Some of you, I know your stories. At least enough of your stories to know about the times that your hope burned through. I mean, maybe you asked Jesus in your heart when you were a little bitty kid. But by the time you survived junior high and high school, oh my goodness, you had nothing left. Some of you, some of you turned your back completely on the faith of your childhood until somehow by God's grace... Maybe in the midst of a marriage, there was just enough, just enough of a burning ember that between the two of you, there was something to blow on that flame a little bit. But even that didn't last until you had a crisis in your marriage, or maybe until you had a pregnancy that didn't go well, or maybe a child was blessed into your home, but then you spent a little time in children's mercy. Man, nothing will build your faith like coming to the end of yourself, right? Has your hope ever burned through? I'm betting it has. I'm betting it has. And here comes the real question. The real question is this. Can your hope be resurrected? Or, having died out, is that just the end of the story? And for a lot of people, it is the end of the story. And there's a voice from the enemy that says, it whispers in your ear, this is the end of your story. You were naive to think there was ever anything but this. And the rest of your life is going to be a downhill slope from here. But that's a lie. Can we just expose that? That's a lie. And I want us to talk today about a hope 
that is higher than I, a hope that comes. There's this there's this line in 1 Peter chapter 1, and I want to just invite you there. And I just want to give you some, some highlight verses. Some highlight verses from 1 Peter 1 and 2, and then a few other places. And, and I want to invite you maybe to write these down. Maybe go back to them before the game starts later. And invite the Lord to sow these seeds deep in your heart. But 1 Peter 1, 13, Peter says, Look, therefore, with minds that are alert and sober... Set your heart on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming with minds that are alert and sober. Because I'm not talking about a wishful thinking kind of hope. I'm not. I'm not talking about a hope, a hope that somehow you have to sort of gin up in your heart. I'm not talking about a hope that you have to kind of get whipped up in your mind and like, you know, have a Christianity that feels a lot like a multi-level marketing rally. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a kind of hope that is alert and sober-minded, a kind of hope that takes in the facts and then says, the final word is held by Jesus, not by the doctor. The final word is held by Jesus, not by the government. The final word is held by Jesus, not by the lawyers. The final word, you see what I'm saying? And he says, he says, be alert and be sober-minded and set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. And that's not just a somewhere far off someday, guys. Jesus Christ could be revealed to you right now today. I don't know if you knew that. Jesus Christ could be revealed to you in the moment of worship. Jesus Christ could be revealed to you here and now. Jesus Christ could be revealed to you as you get up tomorrow morning and you're drinking your coffee and and the Lord speaks a hope into your heart. Jesus Christ could be, this is not some far off somewhere. This is an alert, sober-minded, but genuine encounter with God. Be alert. Be sober-minded until the day Jesus Christ is revealed in you. I was talking to a, a, a friend of mine right before youth camp, Ethan. It was right when you guys were getting, it was the Sunday before you guys were heading off to youth camp. And this one brother, he came to me and he said, he said, you know what? He said, he said, unexpectedly, I'm going to get to go to youth camp. I wasn't planning to. I didn't have the resources for it. I didn't even have the desire for it. But the circumstances changed and I'm going to get to go. Would you just pray for me? Because I really need God to show up for me at youth camp. And I said, praise God, absolutely, I'll pray, pray into that with you. And so, and so we talked about it a little bit. I said, you know, are there some things that, that honestly you need to lay down and leave behind when you go to youth camp in order for God to speak, in order for you to hear? He said, yeah, there really is. And we had a hard conversation about some addictive patterns that happen in a lot of young men's lives, about pornography and pot and other substances that that. A person, when their hope gets burned out and burned through, can be a place that you turn for a little momentary salve in your soul. And he said, yeah, I'm at a place where if I don't, if I don't come out from under those habits, they're going to become lifelong addictions. And I want, to, I want to stop it now. I want to nip it now and be done with it. So we prayed. We prayed right there. We prayed right there. And, and when he got back from youth camp, I asked him, I said, how'd it go? How'd it go? You know what he told me? He said, he, said, he said, God showed up, man. God showed up. It was so cool. You had an encounter with God. I had an encounter with God. It's great. Praise God for that. And here's what I told him. I said, look, it's no, it's no surprise to me that God showed up at youth camp. The question is, will God continue to show up now that you're home? And that's what you pray into when your hope begins to burn through. When your hope begins to burn out. Lord, in Jesus' name. Because here's a verse I gave this brother. It's, it's in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. It says, he who began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I love the amplified version of that. Mindy's favorite version of that verse. He who began a good work in you will perform it and perfect it and complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's what that brother needed to hear. That's what I need to hear if I spend too much time on social media. That there is a Lord who is at work in me to perform and perfect and complete his good work until the day of Jesus Christ. Be alert and be sober-minded, setting your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. And it can be revealed to you today. 
today, in this moment. And it's a supernatural encounter with God. And maybe today is the day. Just bow your heads and close your eyes for just a second. Lord, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, would you sit yourself down next to brothers and sisters that are here today? Would you come among us, Lord Jesus, by your spirit in this moment, would you reveal yourself to our hearts? Would you break some addictive chains in the lives of some brothers of mine, Lord? Would you break some addictive chains in the lives of some sisters of mine today as you reveal yourself in this worship moment? In Jesus' name, amen? amen. Come on, a better amen than that. Because God can do that. God can do that. Be alert, be sober-minded. And set your hope on the grace to be brought when Jesus Christ is revealed. A few verses later, he says this. He says, he says live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. That's 1 Peter 1, verse 17. Live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear because this world is not my home. Another old hymn lyric, right? This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. And if you live as if this world is your home, you're going you're gonna to take on a mortgage that you can't afford because you're trying to create heaven on earth. And if you live your life as if this world was your home, you're going you're gonna to reach way beyond your capacity. And you're going you're gonna to undervalue some people's friendship and overvalue the friendship of others. There will be people that you mistake and you say, I admire that person, when really what it is is you want to be admired by that person because you put your hope in the here and eternity is actually set in your heart. You see what I'm saying? He says, live this life, live this life as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ. There's this, there's this thing that is set up. If you go back later and you read 1 Peter 1 and 2, if you go back later and read it, you will find this, this dichotomy that sets up between the precious and the profane, this dichotomy that's set up between the perishable and the imperishable. He says, you were, not, you were not redeemed. You were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold. But we call those things precious metals, right? We, 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 we uh, attach value to those precious metals. But he says, it wasn't, with, it wasn't with perishable things like silver and gold that you were redeemed. It was with blood of Jesus, because God had said eternity in your heart. He goes on just a few verses later. He says, he says, you were born again. You were born again, verse 23, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. Your faith, your hope are in God. Through him you believe in God. And he says, therefore, Therefore, rid yourselves, chapter 2, verse 1, rid yourselves of all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander of every kind. That's what's got creation groaning for its redemption. Because this creation of God has been, has been adulterated, right? It's been adulterated. And we are seeing the outwork of all of that in our life and in our times. And, and Peter says, rid yourselves of the malice and the deceit and the hypocrisy and the envy and the slander of every kind. It sounds like social media. And he, say, he just says, he says, don't live that way. Don't, don't live allowing that to be the thing that draws your eye and draws your attention. Don't live that way. There's another way you could choose to live. He says, like newborn babes crave the pure spiritual milk. There's a place in Hebrews where he says, where he says look, you've been living long enough on milk. It's time for some meat. But a lot of us, a lot of us just need a do-over. A lot of us just need to go back to the beginning in our walk with the Lord and say, God, would you just, could you breathe some new hope into me? Could you breathe some new life into me? God, would you just, would you treat me like I, like I need to recuperate? Would you treat me like I need to get my strength back, Lord? Would you, would you feed me? Because if you don't feed me, I'm going to die. Like newborn babes crave the pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. By it you may grow up in your salvation now that you've tasted 
that the Lord is good. I love that. Now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. Actually, I probably shouldn't be presumptuous, should I? Have you tasted that the Lord is good? Because I know an awful lot of people who have settled for an intellectual version of Christianity instead of an experiential version that has to do with tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. I've got a place marked in my Bible. I've got a place marked in my Bible in Psalm 34 where it says, where it says this. Well, let me find it. Here it is. Here it is in Psalm 34 where it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. But if you've settled, if you've settled for an intellectual brand of Christianity, maybe you haven't taken refuge in him. Maybe you haven't tasted and seen that the Lord is good. But the Lord invites you into that. Now that you've tasted, now that you've tasted, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. Just a, a few pages later, I've got it marked in my Bible. There's one in Psalm 61. It says, it says, from the ends of the earth, I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. That's where the title for this message comes from. Hope that is higher than I. Because if my hope is, is only as high as I can reach, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to burn through it. If my hope is only as strong as I can hold on to, I'm going to burn through it. If my hope only goes as far as I can understand and wrap my mind around, it's not going to carry me. I cry to you from the ends of the earth. I call to you as my heart grows faint. Isn't that what it looks like when your hope begins to burn through? A heart that grows faint? I, I call to you as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. You've been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. And maybe that's the kind of prayer that we ought to be praying. Let me just pray that over you, Lord, in Jesus' name, that we could take refuge in you. When, when we come to the place that we're not strong enough for, when we come to the place that we don't have the, the mental capacity to understand and process, when we can't figure it all out, Lord, in Jesus' name, may we, we, may we run to the, to the Lord who is the strong tower. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and they are saved. Lord, in Jesus' name, would you pour hope into my heart? I need it, Lord. I need it. Go back with me again to 1 Peter chapter 2, where it says, where it says, now that you've tasted that the Lord is good, verse 3, now that you've tasted that the Lord is good, as you come to him, Jesus, as you come to Jesus, the living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious. And I want us to spend just a few minutes, just a few minutes around this idea of, of burned out stones. Nehemiah chapter 4 talks about burned out stones. There's a, there's a place where Ezekiel has a vision of a valley of dry bones. It says, can these bones live? There's, a, there's that same kind of understanding as Nehemiah. Small little book. It's only 12 chapters. Small little book in the Old Testament. It's, it's, it's before Psalms and all that. It, it's kind of back there. It's a little hard to find because it's very short. But Nehemiah is rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem where they've been torn down. And they've just been left like, like leaving the Legos out on the carpet. And the, and, the, and the walls, the stones, they've just been torn down and they've been burned with fire and they look like rubble. And it says this, let me, let me pull it up. I've got it here in Nehemiah chapter 4. When Sanballat, the enemy of their soul, right, the, the spiritual uh, opposer, when Sanballat, the enemy, heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and he was greatly incensed and he ridiculed the people of God. He ridiculed the Jews and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? And that's how the enemy of your soul works, right? There's a lot of shame involved when you start hearing the voice of the enemy. There's a lot of shaming kind of language that comes when you hear the voice of the enemy in your ears. What are these feeble children of God trying to do? What are these feeble children of God trying to do? He says, will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring these stones back to life from these heaps of rubble burned as they are? And it brings up the question, can these stones live. Has your hope ever burned through? I'm betting it has. 
Peter talks about it. He says, he says, you come to him, the living stone, the living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God. And then he says, and you too, you too, like living stones are being built into a spiritual house, a holy habitation for the Lord. But what if your stones have been burned out? What if your hope has been burned through? What if you got nothing left? Yeah, you asked Jesus in your heart when you were a kid a long time ago. Yeah, you had some encounters with God years ago when you were a teenager going to youth camp. But that was then, this is now. Life has happened. And when life happened, it burned through your hope. What are you going to do now? And the enemy of your soul whispers in your ear, what do you think you're doing? Who do you think you are? What are these feeble children of God doing? Will they restore their wall? <laughs> do they honestly think they can accomplish this? What are they do? Will, will they offer their sacrifices again? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life? Ezekiel's question, can these bones live? You know, Lord. It's a God thing, not a me thing. So what do you do? What do you do? If, you're, if your hope has been built on the wrong foundation, what do you do if your hope has been burned through? Can your hope be resurrected? Nehemiah, Nehemiah offers some, some thoughts on that, some help with that. And he, he gives us some things, and I'm just going to walk you through a few, a few phrases here in Nehemiah chapter 4. I'm going to walk you through some phrases when the questions come. Can these stones live? Will the wall be restored? Will they finish in a day? There's heaps of rubble, burned as they are. Nehemiah says this in Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah says, hear us, our God. Hear us, our God. We are despised, turn their insults back on their heads, give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Don't cover up their guilt or blot out their sin from your sight, for they've thrown insults in the face of the builders. Verse 6, so we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. The people worked with all their heart. Some of you may be asking yourselves, you've been coming to church you, you, you had told yourself, you know, when they finish that new church up there, I see them working on it. When they finish that, I'm going to go check it out. You've come and checked it out. You've been kicking the tires. You've been sniffing around to say, is this a place where, you know, I could find some hope? And you're asking yourself, you've been asking yourself, when's it going to work? When's it going to start working? When's it going to get traction in my soul? When's all this going to start taking effect? I've come several times. You know, I've checked this out. When's it going to start working for me? Maybe it's going to start when you stop looking around and start going after it with all your heart. I'm just saying. Maybe it's going to work. Maybe it's going to start kicking in when you stop kicking the tires and you dive in with both feet. When you, when you say, you know what, no more checking around the edges. I, I, I'm going to go all in with Jesus. You may say, well, that's not my style. I'm going to hang back. Okay, hang back. Check it out. Check it out. Look around. See what other people are experiencing. Maybe ask some people in whom you do see some hope. What's the reason for the hope they profess? But when the time comes, when the time comes, Nehemiah says, so we rebuilt the wall till it reached half its height. The enemy says, are they going to finish in a day? No, we're not going to finish in a day. Of course we're not going to finish in a day. Nothing of value is finished in a day. He says, we rebuilt the wall till it reached half its height because the people worked at it with all their heart. When's it going to start working? When you start working it. When you start diving in and holding on. Maybe write down Nehemiah chapter 4, 1 Peter 1 and 2. And sometime before the game starts, you go back and read them and you ask the Lord, Lord, in Jesus' name, would you, would you sow more deeply the seed that I heard about this morning in service? Maybe you go back and you say, when you, when you get ready to go to bed tonight, maybe you say, Lord, in Jesus' name, would you remind me tomorrow morning of the determination that I had going to bed tonight that I want this week to be different? Lord, would you empower me? Would you pour your spirit out in me? Would you, would you revive hope in me? Maybe it'll start working when you start working it. 
Nehemiah, Nehemiah says, the people, they, they started working at it with all their heart. Uh, you, you go a few verses later. Uh, it says, they plotted together, the enemy of our souls. Verse 8. They plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. Verse 9, he says, but we prayed to our God and we posted a guard day and night to meet the threat. Can I tell you something? Nothing that you pursue in the spiritual realm will go spiritually unopposed. Don't be surprised when the enemy of your soul comes against a renewal of hope that's going on in your heart. Don't be surprised about that. Don't be surprised if the enemy says, if the enemy says, who do you think you are? Well, I'll tell you who I think I am. I am a living child of the living God. That's who I am. I I am redeemed by the blood of Jesus, not not perishable things like silver and gold. I didn't earn my way into this. I was bought with a price with the precious blood of Jesus. the, The seed that was sown in me is the imperishable seed of Jesus. That's who I think I am. And 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 he says, he says, look, we prayed to our God and we posted a guard because the enemy of our soul is real. And we're gonna stand firm against it. And we're going to hold on until we see Christ form in us the thing that he started doing in us at the beginning. We're going to keep holding on to that. Nehemiah says, we prayed and we posted a guard. I'm, going to, I'm just giving you a couple of highlights. You can go back later and read all this. Later it says, he, Nehemiah says, look, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords and their spears and their bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, I said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families. Can I tell you something? Sometimes the enemy of your soul, the enemy of your sons and your daughters, sometimes does not give up easily. So do you give up hope? Or do you pray and you post a guard? Do you give up hope? Or do you, or do you, or do you work at it with all your heart? Do you give up hope? Or do you remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families? When's it going to work? Well, well, maybe it's going to work. Maybe it's going to work when you start working it. The people worked at it with all their hearts. Go back with me again to 1 Peter chapter 2 for just a minute. 1 Peter chapter 2 where it talks about... You come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. And you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, a holy habitation, to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus. Verse 9, 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, God's special possession, God's peculiar treasure in all the earth. Chosen people, royal priesthood, holy possession, special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Do you remember when you lived in darkness? You do, don't you? Don't you remember what it was like when you stumbled and fumbled around in darkness. It was miserable. It was hopeless. It was despairing. He says, once, he's called you out of that darkness. He's called you into his wonderful light. He says, once, you were not a people. Do you remember what it was like when you were not a people, when you were on your own in the world? Bryce, join me, would you? Do you remember what it was like when, when, when you were a lone wolf And the enemy of your soul would go about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he just kept picking you off. He knew. He knew what to use against you in terms of temptation. He knew what to use against you in terms of distraction. He knew. He knew where your buttons were and he knew how to push them. Once you were not a people. But now, he says, you're the people of God. Once, you had not received mercy. You remember those days, don't you? When you lived without mercy? When you lived out from under the mercy of God? When everything was hard? You remember times like that, right? 
You may find yourself right now. There's a lady, there's a lady that talked to me recently. She said, everything's just really hard for me right now. And she was despairing. She was hopeless. Man, I didn't have an answer for her. I didn't, I didn't have any way to say, you know what? If you'll just do these three things, everything will turn around for you. I didn't have a formula for her. You know all I could do for her? The only thing I could do for her was call on the name of the Lord and invite the Lord to just come down on her and in her and in her moment. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. Once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. You used to live in darkness, but God has called you into his marvelous light. And the enemy keeps whispering in your ear, who do you think you are? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Who do you think you are? I am a living child of the living God. That's who I am. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. I am part of the people of God, and I have received mercy. That's who I am. Will they rebuild that wall? You bet we will. You bet we will. Will they finish in a day? No. We won't finish in a day. We won't finish in a lifetime. But the one who began a good work in us is faithful to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Will they offer sacrifices? You bet we'll offer sacrifices. We will sacrifice our time. We will sacrifice our money. We will sacrifice our preferences. We will sacrifice our comfort. We will do whatever it takes to see his kingdom come and his will being done in the lives of our families, in the lives of our church, in the lives of our community and in our world. You bet we'll offer sacrifices. We'll offer whatever it takes So what is your hope built on? And maybe today if you say, you know what, Rusty, I I know where my hope is supposed to be built. I know what it's supposed to be built on. I'm not, um, I don't know, Rusty, maybe I've, maybe I've, I've misplaced my hope some. Today's your day. Today's your day. Just come and repent. Lord, I've built my hope on something less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. God, forgive me. God, can I begin again? God, may I get a do-over? God, may I start fresh with you today? Has your hope ever burned through? Is that where you're living right now? With burned out rubble? with dry bones on the inside of you. Today's your day. Today's your day. To find a place at this altar. Find someone to pray with you, to just say, Lord, in Jesus' name, would you come by your Holy Spirit? Would you pour out by your Holy Spirit? Lord, would you bring healing by your Holy Spirit? Lord, would you give me new hope by your Holy Spirit? Can your hope be resurrected? You bet it can. And today's your day.